What is going on, everybody? Welcome on into the Heat Check Fantasy Podcast, powered by Number Fire. That is right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network and NumberFire.com, where today we are getting you set for UFC 250. Coming up this weekend, it is a locked uh, a locked card, loaded card, I guess is probably the right, way, the better way to say that. A loaded card for you coming up this Saturday. We're going to break things down from a DFS perspective and let you know which fighters you should target on FanDuel. My name is Jim Sonis. I am a senior writer and analyst for NumberFire.com. Joined here once again by Austin Swain. You can find him on Twitter at a Swain three. He does Number Fire's UFC DFS coverage along with NASCAR and the NBA. Austin, we were talking before last week about how this card we didn't really know a lot about it and then when the details came out you immediately were tweeting about how good of a card this is so i'm just going to ask you how good of a card is it it it, it ended up being a really fantastic card you know there's questions and we'll get into the main event and the competition level there but um a lot of great fights made at bantamweight some title title implications on the main card as well as you got a lot of young prospects uh sprinkled throughout the uh the prelim card as well as the main card as well so a lot of budding ufc stars that they they locked and loaded onto this card it's a second pay-per-view since they returned from the covid break so i was expecting something but uh it kind of weird we don't usually only have to wait a week to know who's fighting on what card but uh, right. a very pleasant surprise last week for sure and it seems like this starts a string where there are like ufc cards like every saturday right for the next well, yeah. couple of weeks yeah there are no- normally the rotation is the first saturday of the month will have a ufc pay-per-view card there will be two tv pay-per-view cards one immediately following the pay-per-view and then the final week of the month and then there's a an iffy uh usually maybe set in a d- different foreign location uh, card that maybe t- it's a slate that may take place at a different time if, if it's taking place in abu dhabi you could have a right. 3 a.m walk um <sighs> so you know that's usually when they'll experiment with the international stuff obviously not now with the covid stuff going on but usually right. there is some sort of ufc action uh every saturday except for occasional holiday breaks and things like that so okay. uh, yeah definitely a sport that you can grind week to week very similar to nascar in that regard absolutely and uh day to day with nascar at this point so it's for been sure. uh, it's been interesting for sure make sure you check out numberfire.com austin will have his helper there for UFC later this week. Also the NASCAR helper for the Atlanta race coming up on Sunday. So go to numberfire.com. Follow Austin on Twitter at aceway 3 One logistical note for this card is that lock is at 4 p.m. Eastern on FanDuel. It has been 6 p.m. on, I think, every other slate since the uh, COVID-19 breakout. So make sure you have your lineups completed before then, just so you are set. Now, I believe it's a staggered lock. Uh, so there are a couple of fights that lock at 4 p.m., and then there are others that lock later. Is there a late swap on this, Austin? I don't know. I probably should have checked this before. But... I, I, I don't believe there will be late swap okay. for it um, or anything like that. You certainly probably wouldn't need it with weigh-ins determined on Friday. Uh, or or if a fighter's feeling ill or going to pull out of the fight, right. it would be Saturday morning. So you're not going to get into a situation you get in with NBA with last-minute lineup changes or anything like that. So you should be good to go to to begin your lineup building process after weigh-ins are completed. You know, we'll watch for obviously any substitutes on fights later this week. You know, we've covered a few of those in the podcast, yep. but um, you should you we should be good to go with what we have stacked here. And given it's taking place in Las Vegas, uh, same place as last week, should be no logistical issues like visas or anything like that. So um, uh, crossing my fingers, everything yeah. will stay <laughs> uh, as we preview it today. Imagine checking beforehand. I did yes. not, but I did not. So whatever. We're going to roll on with this preview here in just one second and get Austin's full thoughts on this car. But first, as mentioned, UFC 250 is coming up on June 6th, and there is no better way to bet the fights than on FanDuel Sportsbook. Right now, new users can get an exclusive odds boost when you sign up. Just join FanDuel Sportsbook, and they will boost Amanda Nunes' odds to beat Felicia Spencer from minus 650. I believe that's minus 700 now to plus 250 that means you can bet up to 20 dollars on the favorite to win up to 50 dollars to claim your exclusive odds boost just sign up for FanDuel sportsbook and deposit to see the odds 21 plus and present in new jersey pennsylvania indiana west virginia and colorado first online wager only except in colorado must wager in designated offer market ten dollar minimum first deposit required fifty dollar max bonus gambling problem 
Call 1-800-GAMBLER. In Indiana, call 1-800-9-WITH-IT. In West Virginia, visit www.1800gambler.net. In Colorado, call 1-800-522-4700. How many disclaimers can we make within one read? (laughs) We will find out. Almost as many disclaimers as there are fights on this card. It is a 12-fight card, so let's dive on in and break this one down. As you heard there in that read, Amanda Nunes is on the is the headliner here she is going up against felicia spencer it's a five-round fight and we always start things off here on the podcast austin by discussing those but this one's different because nunez is minus 750 so even you know longer than i thought it was minus 750 and she's minus 250 to win by knockout or submission at fanduel sportsbook so is this fight as one-sided in your eyes as the sportsbooks be it or sportsbooks view it as viewing uh, absolutely view it, view it as being my yeah. gosh yeah Happy yeah Monday. Abs- absolutely yeah it, it's certainly a monday but i i think the sports books certainly have it correct here and this is a dynamic you'll see in women's mixed martial arts and that it's relatively new to the scene you know about 15 years old at this point so the the competition level is hit and miss from time to time and you'll find that nunez is a minus 750 favorite to win and and certainly you mentioned the method of victory proposals there you'll see similar things when valentina shevchenko defends her title at 120 five pounds. Amanda Nunes, Valentina Shevchenko, really the two dominant women in mixed martial arts. And you look at Nunes, she's arguably the, the greatest of all time. She's the Michael Jordan of women's mixed martial arts. If you look at her resume, she's knocked out Ronda Rousey. She's knocked out Holly Holm. She's defeated Shevchenko twice as well. She's she's a little bit bigger than Shevchenko, so that was a tough uh, a tough fight at, at, a, at a higher weight class for Shevchenko. And she knocked out Chris Cyborg, who Chris Cyborg, when she was fighting uh, with Bellavator and Invicta, was uh, this terrifying uh, woman that nobody wanted any piece of. Felicia Spencer faced her as well. Nunes has dispensed of all of them. Um, so the best women's mixed martial, martial artist ever, Nunes, has beaten all of them, and so she rightfully deserves that title of the GOAT of women's mixed martial arts. And, and and really, Felicia Spencer, it's not her fault that she's going in here as such a huge underdog, because she's really one of the best 145-pounders, so that again, that's featherweight. That's one of the, that's the biggest, actually, UFC weight class for women, so 145 pounds. This is their version of heavyweight. She's about as good of a challenger as you can find at 145. Like I said, she went the distance with uh, Chris Cyborg and pretty easily knocked out uh, Zara Fairn in her last fight. But um, Nunes' just level of competition is as good pound for pound at women's or men's anywhere compared to their respective talent as far as the names she's got on her hit list. And, and the reason why is because every woman that's fighter says she's the hardest woman who, who's ever hit her, right? And that power makes a substantial difference when you're striking with her on the feet. The, the idea she used a leg kick to knock out Holly Holm, who's an accomplished kickboxer, maybe the most successful in the history of North America. Um, she just has so many different different tools in her toolkits, well-trained in submission. That's really kind of what she broke into MMA as. So well-rounded. And, and Felicia Spencer, you look on the other side, she's more of a submission artist, right? That's how she, her claim to fame. And so, of course, there's a potential at plus 450 or whatever odds you happen to get Felicia Spencer at. She catches Nunez in a mistake. Um, and we've seen big upsets in women's fights before. You'll hit Ronda Rousey and Holly Holm. Uh, but I think Nunez has worked every penny as a big favorite um, it, to win. And, and you mentioned the odds boost as well. That's, that sounds like a great deal to me. <laughs> Um, at plus 250 because she's certainly going to have an advantage in all three dimensions and the sports book if you look at it it's reflected of that all three of her method of victory props are greater than any of felicia spencer's right and this is coming from felicia spencer the submission artist actually has less of a chance to submit amanda nunez than the other way around so um i, I love nunez in this fight and and she's the most expensive player in the for a reason i haven't even touched on the fact this is five rounds and she has a high floor for fantasy for that so i very much am all into amanda all things amanda nunez this weekend in the main event so amanda Amanda Nunez, $23 on FanDuel. And on on FanDuel, Austin, we have that MVP slot, which is a 1.5x multiplier for the fighter you decide to put in that slot. They have the same salary as they would have if they were a regular fighter. And with the odds being so heavily in favor of Nunez, both to win and to win early, potentially, is she going to be the default MVP pick for you on FanDuel? Yeah, absolutely, and, and we'll get in. We'll dive into the big three that we'll discuss probably throughout this this podcast when you look at FanDuel's player pool. But Nunes is not is the most comfortable option to win. She has the best odds there. She has the five round volume for that the other two options that we'll get to don't necessarily have in her favor, and she's also got the the best most accomplished resume. So I trust the skill set that she's bringing in. She's not a prospect, and she's not facing the toughest fighter she's ever faced before. She's facing Felicia Spencer, who who may not even crack that top five. Um, 
um, as far as the most difficult opponents she's faced. And, and Nunez has beat much tougher competition. So I'm definitely going to turn to Nunez most often at $23 at the MVP slot. Uh, we talked about in the first podcast, Lamar Jackson and Patrick Mahomes are usually worth it for a reason. Uh, <laughs> Amanda Nunez has everything, every box checked this weekend in the MVP slot. And uh, it, it's an option that, that I very much like to have there for that comfort. Is there a gap between her and the field? Or do you think that there are other fighters who are at least like viable alternatives for that MVP slot? Uh, right. So so let's talk about so let's talk about the big three, right? You look yeah, at so you go look the at the big Fandles. three you are alluding to are Sean O'Malley, Alonzo Menafield, and Amanda Nunes. They are the three most expensive fighters on this card. And they both have really good odds to get a, a win via knockout or via submission. Uh Menafield is minus 150, O'Malley is minus 185, and Nunez is at, at minus 250. So all these fighters have really good odds to get an early win. Do you think they're in the same tier as Nunez, though? Um, I, I, I would say that the argument's certainly there for, for Sean O'Malley, right? Okay. Uh, in that uh, when you look at Sean O'Malley's matchup, um, he he is in a situation where he's facing Eddie Wineland, UFC veteran, but really in a way, it, it, it's very clear what the plan is for him, and the make it, matchup makes a lot of sense for him as a viable prospect. He's the next great thing at bantamweight, 135 pounds. Um, the star potential is obvious because he's 5'11", which is very, very tall for 135 pounds. He's an outstanding striker on the feet, um, tons of length and cardio. Really, his claim to fame is he broke his leg in the middle of a fight against Andre Sukumtoth and still won the fight. Uh, oh, gosh. <laughs> debatable, debatable fight IQ from Sukum thought to let him wrestle instead of making him stand up and fight oh, on his broken gosh. leg. But um, that was really a, a coming out moment for Sean O'Malley. He's developed a following on Twitch. He's a very popular fighter uh, amongst the uh, amongst the uh, uh, the UFC roster. And it's very obvious what they're doing for O'Malley is they're trying to fast track him back toward title contention. And so he got a matchup that was probably, you know, Brian Kelleher, uh, Brian Boom Kelleher. We'll talk about him. He's also on this card. He asked for O'Malley. The UFC kind of hit him away from O'Malley because Kelleher's got big hands and, and Wineland is certainly an, an aging veteran coming off two or three losses, big deficits in the height and reach department as well as volume as well. Um, you know, uh, O'Malley's certainly a star in the making and, and they set him up in a position to win. Why he's a little bit lower than Nunes for me is obviously the five round floor. Okay, and anything, anytime you have a prospect that's moving up the UFC rank, you never technically know when they're going to hit their ceiling, when they're going to meet their skill level in the tiers of fighters that they should be training for and getting better at. So um, I certainly feel more comfortable with Nunes than O'Malley by a little bit. Um, and, and for me, at least, it's it's a little bit further back of a gap to Alonzo Menafield. So when you talk about Alonzo Menafield, um, I, I checked this morning, he's down to plus 100 to knock out uh, his opponent, Devin Clark, this morning on FanDuel Sportsbook. It, it has been minus money odds uh when it released as well so um he he's pretty much what the ufc dreams of it light heavyweight he's got nine wins nine knockouts can't do can't do much better than that inside an mma venue um and he's really kind of beat up though on the two weakest light heavyweights on the roster though you know yeah paul paul bear drew craig was his last opponent uh interesting style and in that i he, all the time he'll lay on his back to try to get people to like submit an opponent and the referee will have to stand him back up because really what he's trying to do is grapple on the ground exclusively doesn't offer a lot in terms of striking uh, and, and then you look at his other opponent, Vince Moreira, lost to Paul Craig. So, you know, this has really kind of been the bottom of the barrel. He sees a little bit of a step up with a guy like Devin Clark, who just had a great performance against Johnny Townsend. He was on top of him for 10 minutes in that fight as a wrestler. And so that type of top control, really just total domination defensively. Uh, Townsend only was recorded with six si significant strikes in that fight. Um, the game plan is very clear for Devin Clark against Menafield is I don't want him to hit me in the face with one of his fists. So I'm going to try to hold him down onto the mat and, and control him that way. Um, Menafield's never been taken down in the UFC. So Clark would certainly have to be a different level wrestler than he's faced so far. Um, but Clark has been knocked out twice in his career as well. Um, a, so he's susceptible to that. That's why you see the odds on the knockout. But um, with a prospect like Menafield, I don't have the same tape even as I do with O'Malley. Um, and, and I have I have a path to victory with a guy with UFC success on the other end. So um, for me, it's Nunes and then a little bit back to Sean O'Malley and then a little bit back further to Alonzo Menafield. That's the order of salary they're in as well. So it right. uh, makes it simpler in that regard. But even if the salaries are in that order, there is if if you view there as being a tier between yeah. Nunez and O'Malley, or Nunez, O'Malley, and then Menafield, that can say to you, okay, I think Nunez and O'Malley are worth their salaries, whereas Menafield may not be. Is that kind of the way you're viewing those three? Right. And um, 
yeah, right. That if if you look and you tried to cram all three into a lineup, it doesn't really make very much sense to do so. Uh, because <laughs> what you would be doing is you'd be playing Eddie Wineland and Devin Clark against their opponent. That's going right. to significantly hamper your upside. Um, it, as far as fitting them all into your lineup. So you're going to have to choose uh, on an individual lineup basis. And obviously, if you multi-enter in tournaments, you can vary your exposures depending on how comfortable you are. Um, but when you look at when you look at um, all three of them, I certainly have the most faith in Amanda Nunes because even if she goes to a decision, I've got the five-round four there. And then Sean O'Malley, I just feel like, is facing a, a weaker opponent compared to his, uh, his talent level. And so Menafield really doesn't feel worth that $21, even though on a normal slate like last week when when I'm turning MVP to a guy who's never thrown more than 50 strikes in his UFC career, I would have loved a guy like Menafield coming in with knockout potential. Maybe he takes a back seat on a card with with heavier favorites here. Are you viewing this as being a slate where you want to go stars and scrubsy? Like obviously like you said you can't fit all three in. But yeah. if you go Nunes and O'Malley together, you have $55 remaining for your final four slots, which is $14 per fighter. Do you think that is a viable approach, or are you kind of picking between Nunes and O'Malley and then going balanced from there? Um, it, certainly in tournaments, I, I would vary. Uh, in cash games, I would play both Nunes and O'Malley together just because you have the, the high odds of victory there with the upside potential. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll get into some of the value that we see later, but I think it's possible that you can jam two of those studs in together. And hey, you know— it, Every UFC slate, you kind of have to make a fork in the road. If you really, especially now hearing me say, well, there's more of a clear path to Devin Clark, then all of a sudden you get the reduced ownership of a guy who still has the potential to knock out his opponent very quickly. Um, so th there's a fork in the road that you make when forming your, forming your strategies for tournaments um, in a player pool this small. Uh, something we run into with NASCAR as well is viable players inside the player right. pool makes it harder to differentiate turn up, tournament lineups. Um, but you know, I would limit to two of them, and then certainly you have a lot of flexibility with some very interesting favorites throughout the rest of the card. Um, of the of the slates we've broken down so far, it's occasionally happened in USC history. I could see all 12 favorites winning all 12 fights. And so you can't have Amanda Nunes and Sean O'Malley and four favorites in your lineup. So we kind of have to pick and choose where our spots are and what we're targeting from a fantasy perspective to fit in there. Okay, so it seems like Nunes and O'Malley are the main priorities here. You were talking about Devin Clark. He is plus 360 to get a, a win via knockout or submission, and relative to his salary, that's pretty good. But let's focus on the value plays here. And we want to, if we want to jam in Nunez, Nunez and O'Malley, we got to find a lot of value because again, $14 is more than 11, but it's still not a whole lot on your average per fighter remaining. So. Are there good value plays available on the slate where you can feel comfortable jamming in both Nunes and O'Malley up there? And if so, who stands out to you for those value options? Well, comfort is always subjective, but I do have a few. <laughs> I do have a few options that that we can certainly look at. I I think I'll start bottom up as far as the cheapest fighter that I'm looking at targeting a, a, a lot is a guy Brian Boom Kelleher. We've seen him before on a FanDuel slate. He fought in a fight night card about a month ago in Jacksonville. Um, and when we looked there, uh, we saw him and he was on pace to give up 129 strikes to his opponent, Hunter Azure, before he actually knocked out Azure. Um, but you can see that defensively, he wasn't very sharp in that bout in that Azure's more of a wrestler. He was about to land 129 strikes on him. In comes Cody Stamen, who Cody Stamen's at $18 on FanDuel. One of one of the most interesting bantamweight prospects in that he normally fights at 135 pounds. This fight will be at 145 pounds likely because it'd be tough for Kelleher to cut to 135 on a month's notice, uh, probably pretty hard on his body and would significantly hurt his chances of winning the fight. Um, but so this will take place at 145. It's Stamen's first bout there. Certainly with Kelleher's defensive woes against Hunter Azure, Cody Stamen's much better as a striker than Hunter Azure was. So um, certainly I think there will be volume to be had. And you look what Kelleher did in that way. Kelleher threw plenty himself as well and actually found a path to a knockout finish. He's finished his last two fights as well. That's a guy I kind of want to target in this price range of somebody who has finishing upside both as, with a submission and a knockout and incredible volume that even if he takes a tough decision loss or maybe he's knocked out in the third round, he's got plenty of significant strengths and volume on the board. So I look at a guy like Kelleher, very versatile. Both these guys have over four significant strengths per minute. They're in that smaller 25-foot octagon that's going to force the pace a little bit. Um, 
I certainly can see this as a spot where we target Kelleher um, with win with winning potential. Certainly Kelleher's a live dog in this fight. Um, and then the next guy I'm looking at is Maki P- uh, Patolo at $13. Um, yeah, apologies to Maki if I if I messed up the pronunciation <laughs> of his last name there, but um, he's moving up to 185 pounds. We're seeing some fighters transitioning weight classes in this COVID environment, so that's been very interesting, but he'll move up, but Normally, I'm concerned about size of a fighter moving up. He'll actually have the smallest little bit of height and reach advantages on his opponent, Charles Bird. Bird, $18 in the FanDuel player pool. Um, but Patola's as active as they come. He's done 5.42 significant strikes per minute. Um, he's never attempted a takedown, so it's very clear what his strategy is. Very similar to Justin Gaethje, who we saw a few. Never attempted a takedown. He's trying to stand there and throw punches. That's that's a good thing from a fantasy perspective. And you look at Charles Bird, he'll definitely have an advantage on the ground, but can he even get it there? He's been knocked out in his last two fights, and he's going to see a high-volume striker here with Patolo. That can't be the most comfortable matchup for him. So relative to their odds to victory and, and a method of victory uh, prop in essentially what is a stylistic coin flip for me, will Bird have the advantage wrestling or Patolo striking? At only $13, I'm willing to take that coin flip versus what versus landing on somebody like an Eddie Wineland at $10 or a Felicia Spencer at $13 that I don't believe have any chance to win their fight. Uh, Patolo plus 138 to get the win there against Bird, and then Kelleher plus 205 to win against Damon. Now let's talk about Kelleher quickly because, like, again— I don't know a whole lot about USC, so I was surprised last week when Kevin Holland was initially on the slate because he had just fought recently. Obviously, he did wind up dropping out, but now Kelleher also fighting again really quickly. Is that common? And like, does, does that have a negative impact on a fighter's outlook given if they just were in the octagon like less than a month ago? <laughs> Well, Gilbert Burns is an animal. He'd say fooey with that because he's fought six <laughs> times in eight, in eight months or something wow. like that at a variety <laughs> of different weight classes. But uh, normally it is a little concerning. A lot of USC fighters, because of the damage they take, they actually receive a medical suspension from their athletic commission. Um, mm. So they're not even allowed to fight in a in a combat sports event until their medical suspension expires. Um, certainly Kelleher took plenty of damage in that fight. You know, like I said, Azure landed plenty of strikes. And so I'm a little surprised to see him back so quickly, but I think Kelleher was initially targeting uh, a match against Sean O'Malley on this card. Uh, and you know, O'Malley, we no- had known he was going to return on June 6th for a while now. So um, I think when that kind of fell apart and they didn't let Kelleher have a shot at O'Malley, he still took a fight on the card anyway. Um, so is there a concern with, with the damage in there? Perhaps, but also I have a guy that has octagon experience within the last month and he's not going to have quote unquote ring rust as it's been told right. sometimes. So, um, um, you know, it, it 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 certainly goes one way or another. I I think as these fighters continue to train and their diet and their weight cutting abilities, uh, Kelleher certainly he he's normally fought at 135 pounds his whole career. He's fought both of these fights at 145 pounds, so he doesn't have to cut as much weight. So it may not be as taxing to him physically, and that's why he feels like he's game for this fight, you know. Um, and, and you know he's in fighting shape. He hasn't taken an eight-month layoff to to eat fried chicken and do that type of stuff and then get back in the training routine. You know he's been back in the gym uh, uh, training for this match, but he certainly took a very difficult opponent here uh, on short notice. But Kelleher's a live dog in just about any fight, so uh, any MMA uh, fanatic will tell you that. The idea of fighting twice professionally within a, within a month is just yeah. the most mind-boggling thing I've ever heard. So Absolutely. kudos to him. I couldn't do it, but more power to him for J- sure. Jim Gilbert Burns would fight again this weekend if you asked him to. Some of these I'm not going to ask him to. He doesn't have to worry about that. I'm not going to ask. Believe he, me. <laughs> he only took 29 strikes, so I think he'd be good for it. Not a lot of damage from Tyron Woodley on Saturday if you watch I'm the card. I'm sure he would be just fine against yeah. him, regardless <laughs> of how many he took. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to avoid that one personally. Yeah. Now, Austin, the interesting thing here is that with this emphasis on Nunes and O'Malley specifically – we're kind of disregarding the middle tier because if you use those two, yes, we can get there via fighters like Kelleher and potentially Patolo, but we're probably still going to wind up ignoring the middle tier. And like you said, there are some interesting fighters in that middle tier on FanDuel in the $16, 17 $18 range who could have finishing upside and could get the, the win via knockout or submission. Which fighters do you think in that middle range have the potential for a huge fantasy performance that could go a bit overlooked here? 
Right. And I want to take this this section to touch on a little bit on what I've talked about earlier, which is the smaller octagon. It's 25 feet is the diameter on the octagon they're using at the UFC Apex facility both last weekend and this upcoming weekend. Um, and a lot of betting sharps and people, they'll ask you, you know, Austin, we, you know, you got to stack favorites in your fantasy lineup because everything's going to be a submission or knockout because the smaller octagon's going to force people to be together. Uh, last week, the three highest level fights, the last three fights of the evening, they all went to decision. Um, so I, I really haven't altered my process for the smaller octagon because I liken it to you're a baseball guy. You have the solo shot podcast you do. Um, if every game was played at Coors Field, then all of a sudden stacking oh Coors would – Yeah, oh, it'd be, it'd be quite a <laughs> <laughs> The thought of doing that and trying to pick pitchers gives me like yeah, the high Anxiety, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it, it, but if everybody's dealing with that same condition, then all of a sudden we'd revert back to looking at matchups and styles and, and that type of thing when you're looking at analyzing uh, baseball from a daily fantasy. I think of the octagon in no different way. You know, I still had plenty of points by points, method of victory props that I was interested in last week that I'm still interested in this week because st- fighters will pick their style. You know, you could put Tyron Woodley in a four inch octagon. He still wouldn't throw punches, <laughs> um, you know, in a phone booth. He, that's just who he is. He's going to sit behind the cage and, and look for the overhand right. Um, so I'm not really. I don't feel the necessity to go get favorites that I think are going to knock their opponent out because I still think we're going to see decision uh, decisions on Saturday, just like we did this past Saturday. But I look at the styles that some of these fights have made for us. There are a lot of spots where I'm looking at that I say, yeah, I could see a finish there. Um, and so I just wanted to touch on three of them. Uh, I, I think the first place I'm going to turn, we've talked about Sean O'Malley being the future at Bantamweight, 135 pounds. He's undefeated, 5'11". He's very, that was Cody Garbrandt, who's actually in the co-main event, the second to last fight of this card. Um, he, he's a lower ranked fighter than the Bantamweights that are the third card. That's Aljamain Sterling and Cody Sandhagen. But he he got the more preferential spot, and the reason why is because Garbrandt is fireworks. He's exciting. Um, he got it, let his temper get the best of him, and he got knocked out by TJ Dillashaw twice in his two championship bouts there. But this is a guy who held the championship belt at only 26 years old at a team alpha male. There are questions about his fight IQ. Um, you know, he was able to get in a scrap with Pedro Munoz, and Munoz caught him with a shot and knocked him out. So when you look at Garbrandt coming off of three straight knockout losses, that's not typically a guy you want to pay $17 for in a FanDuel player pool. But I think he sees a favor return to matchup here. Uh, if you look at Garbrandt statistically, nothing really pops off the charts because he's at 3.35 significant strikes per minute. But you you look at, that's at 37% efficiency. So you only get significant strikes per minute if you actually land them. Garbrandt's just throwing a ton. He's not landing as much. Um, but the thing is, he has a reputation for having some of the most power at bantamweight. It's either him or Peter Yan, who's about to fight for the title. Um, he, he, he's getting a matchup here with Rafael Asuncao, a veteran who's 38 years old. is not exactly a very high high accuracy striker either he only lands 41 percent of the time he's sliding down in the rankings he's coming off of two straight losses i think this is a position ufc has put cody garbrandt in because cody garbrandt's the type of exciting fighter they would like to be in and around the title picture but if he were to get knocked out again on saturday that's four straight knockout losses that's usually when you talk about a fighter perhaps in jeopardy of losing their contract altogether so there's big time pressure on garbrandt but i think they put him in um a position to succeed and normally i'd be scared of the submission skills of a, a brazilian jiu-jitsu expert like Rafael Asuncao, but Garbrandt's never been taken down inside the UFC. He has excellent takedown defense. As bad as his defense is on the feet, his defense from takedowns is excellent, and that's no surprise out of Team Alpha Male. It's a it's a striking heavy gym, so he sees a lot of great uh, uh, strikers in that gym, so they work on takedown defense, I'd imagine, a lot. So I like Garbrandt in that spot at $17. Um, another guy who's going to make it two, two Burns family fights in a row, he's the first card on this week, is Gilbert's brother, Herbert. He faces Evan Dunham in the first first fight of the card. He's definitely not his brother on the feet yet, but he did get a knockout in his UFC debut. And he's built very similar to Gilbert Burns in that his, his, MMA career mostly has begun in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. Gilbert was a world champion. Herbert's that same type of grappler. Um, and so you look at his uh, 5.77 submission attempts per match. It's very obvious what Gilbert, what uh, Herbert, excuse me, is trying to do is his brother. He still is at the point where he's leaning on his Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu heavily. He's not going to stand and engage in a boxing match like his brother Gilbert did last weekend. And you look at that, you look at FanDuel Sportsbook, it reflects that he's at plus 175 to submit Dunham outright. Um, I think he's in a good position to do that against the UFC veteran it's a guy certainly when you get a world-class brazilian jiu-jitsu guy in there first fight on the card um it, a lot of momentum of course coming off of his brother's victory last weekend so that's a, really a great spot that i like herbert burns in to be able to submit his opponent the sports books back that one up and then i want to look somewhere else it's with chase hooper chase hooper um 
the guy's fireworks, okay? He's only 20 years old, so he's the youngest fighter on the UFC roster, and he's not really big for 145 pounds yet. He'll probably, when he, his frame fails out, he'll probably fight closer to 170 pounds. Um, but he's only 20 years old, and he's still growing that muscle, so he's really re- leaning on his grappling at this point in his career. That's why you see the 3.83 submission attempt uh, attempts per match on his resume. Um, he scored a knockout win in his UFC debut, though, and he gets Alex Caceres, who has a reputation amongst MMA faithful as a very inconsistent fighter. He feels like he's traded wins and losses his whole career. He definitely has alternated wins and losses here in his last six fights, and he's been submitted seven times in his MMA career. So I get a guy like Hooper who's coming in. His his main tool in his toolkit at this point is a submission, and Caceres is, uh, has given into that seven times. He's susceptible to that on the ground. I look at Hooper at only $16 really in that very mid-range tier. I have a very clear path to a submission there uh, with him as well. So you can see we have these first-round finishing potentials in this mid-range, but you're not going to be able to afford all of them if you're if you're pairing them with Nunes and O'Malley. So you have to pick very, very carefully uh, on a lineup-to-lineup basis. And your optimism around those fighters is reflected in their betting odds at FanDuel Sportsbook because if you get rid of the big three of Nunes, O'Malley, and Menafield, those three of uh, of Burns, Garbrin, and Hooper are the next three with the best odds to win by knockout or submission. So FanDuel Sportsbook on the same page with you from that perspective. I want to talk to you about Garbrandt quickly because you mentioned that Ben and Funk has had some pretty high-profile losses do you try to look for spots like that where you can buy low on a fighter who may have some stink on them? Or is that, to you, more of an indication that maybe the form is off and you want to stay away? Uh, I, I, so the UFC ma- matchmaking is is very uh, – it's not sty- analytical or anything like that. It's very stylistic. It's really whatever Dana White's feeling at that point in time and what they can get. <laughs> And what they can get the fighters to agree to at that money, if, if right. anyone's paying attention to what's going on with John Jones right now, he just can't. He he doesn't feel like he's about to get paid. That's why he doesn't want to fight anybody. Right. Um, so you know, it's it typically it's just I have to look at the matchup. Usually, if you lose a fight, you will see competition in your next fight that's a, at a lower caliber, and that's what's happened with Garbrandt in that he had the Dillashaw knockout, got the rematch, knocked out again, saw a weaker opponent with Munez Munoz, knocked out again, and so he sees an even weaker opponent this time. So. I typically do look to kind of buy low on some guys that have had uh, a tough a tough bout about that. I think we talked about Edson Barboza a few a few of those. He's had he was on a murderer's row against Khabib Nurmagomedov and uh, Conor McGregor and Justin Gaethje and all of these huge names. He's a good fighter. He's just been in there against the best that anywhere in uh, any humans his size on the planet have had to offer. Right. Um, so I do. I do buy a lot, a lot on okay. fighters like Garbrandt if they finally get a put in a position where they can kind of stabilize their ranking. You know, no doubt. Cody Garbrandt is still a very high caliber fire and he's lost to a lot of great strikers like TJ Dillashaw is maybe the best bantamweight ever. Um, so it's it's certainly not a huge stain on the resume and, and a reason why I'm targeting him for sure. OK, so Garbrandt is seventeen dollars on FanDuel for Saturday's uh, slate. All right, Austin, let's put it all together. We've kind of gone tier by tier already, but let's wrap things up here. Get your final, your conviction for each tier on FanDuel for Saturday. Starting off with the studs, talked about Nunez and O'Malley. Are they definitively the top two studs for you on this card? Absolutely. I'll, I'll be mixing Nunes and O'Malley pretty evenly between my MVP slots. Um, and, and, you know, I, I think I'll sprinkle in some of those submission attempt potential. You have Herbert Burns at $18, some other things where, like we did last week with Jamal Hill, maybe you try to differentiate and get a finish in your MVP slot, maybe pick up a little bit on the field who doesn't use that finish in their MVP slot. Uh, but I'm mostly building around Nunes and O'Malley there. I will stack them together um, in quite a few lineups as well as I will separate them just so I can get some access to some of these other fighters that we've talked about. Menafield, to me, I look at the method of victory uh, props. I feel like Menafield has the most, uh, most obvious path to defeat, which is not something we talk about a lot, but um, I, I see I see the hole there where it's potential that Devin Clark is just a wrestler that he's never seen before and a guy that could really make him struggle. So if I if I have these me- this many confident favorites that can score points easily, I want the most sure bet. And for me, that's Amanda Nunes, number one, and then a little bit behind is Sean O'Malley, number two. Okay, so perfect. That's the default roster construction. Potentially trying to get two of those fighters, but in general, those are going to be your two MVPs, Amanda Nunez and Sean O'Malley. Let's move now to the mid-range, a tier, again, like we said, haven't talked a whole lot about for this podcast. Did get some some thoughts on, on fighters who could finish. 
Who are you looking at and who are you ranking highest in the middle tier on FanDuel for this slate? Right. So so we'll have to force rank a little bit between some of the guys we talked about a few minutes ago with finishing potential. I think first for me is Herbert Burns. I think he sees the weakest opponent um, and and has the most clear stylistic path to victory with his submission attempts there. 5.77 submissions per match is huge. That might be one of the best marks in all of UFC. Uh, right there with Crone Gracie, uh, who fights at, uh, at 155 pounds as well. So, um, I, I think one of the, I think that's the most obvious path to victory there. Um, and then I look at a guy like Chase Hooper coming off a knockout in his UFC debut. He sees an inconsistent veteran. He's got multiple tools in his toolkit and he could do a lot of different things. Well, you know, he, he was ground and pounding with elbows and that's how he won his UFC debut against Daniel Tamor. Um, so he, he has a lot of different tools as well. I trust Hooper's fight IQ too. Um, so I, I think they would not put a prospect that's been this popular this early in a spot where he, he was going to falter this early. Um, I feel pretty confident with Hooper there. And then we go back to Cody Garbrandt. I like buying low on Garbrandt, a guy who, who if I'm in fantasy and I'm hunting for a guy who wants a knockout, if Cody Garbrandt wants a knockout more than I do, um, you know, that's, he doesn't want to go to a decision. He almost would view that as a loss if he doesn't, if he's not able to knock out, he's got 11 wins at bantamweight nine by knockout um I, I love garbrandt in that spot to kind of rebound and get back on track at 135 and the guy we haven't talked about i like neil magny as well he's 18 dollars. he looked outstanding in his debut at 170 pounds against uh yi john lin uh he's fought skinnier uh, before but i think the added weight really made him uh take advantage of his length that he has with his limbs um the only concern there as we'll we'll talk about in the value play slate is i think there's a chance of a decision there just because he's been paced down a little bit by the opponent anthony rocco martin that he's been drawn uh, but Magny is a guy that I that I'm buying certainly in as many formats as I can get. But he's below the other ones just because I don't think the finish potential might be there against Martin, who's a little bit more durable. Okay, so Anthony Rocco, Martin, fourteen dollars. We discussed him, Maki Patolo, and Brian Kelleher, all potential value plays whose names have been floated. But when it all comes down to it, who are going to be your favorite value plays for Saturday night? Yep, and, and, and I think I think here here to do justice for the people listening is let let me first mention the booby traps because we're all going to okay, be looking perfect. for yes, we're going to be looking we're going to be looking for some value plays down in this area to fit some of these studs in. I would avoid a guy like UCA Formiga. You look at him; he's a defensive striker, maybe as maybe as notable a defensive striker as there is in UFC. One point five significant strikes per minute is a very very low volume. That's lower than Tyron Woodley, who we just saw on Saturday do virtually nothing for five rounds. Um, I I would avoid him even with the win bonus in play because even if you get the win bonus, if there's only 15 points on volume alone, 35 points doesn't do a lot for you on FanDuel anyway. Um, And and it's why I'm not too hot on Alex Perez at $18, even though I think he's got a great chance to win that fight outright. Um, And and then I look at Anthony Rocco Martin. He's gone to three straight uh, decisions, 2.70 strikes per minute. Same deal where he just doesn't present the same type of volume upside uh, in this area where I could see him grinding out a decision win, but it may feel like a loss when you look at it in your FanDuel lineup, even if you get the win bonus. So where I'm particularly go- primarily going is I'm looking at Maki Patolo. I think he's got a clear path to victory on the feet. He's the, he, he at plus 130 doesn't have bad odds to win the fight outright, and he has that volume and finish upside as well. I look at a guy like Brian Kelleher. I'm going back to the well. I had him in my helper in his last card, ended up with the knockout win. Kelleher is just a guy whose game, he, he, can, he, he can do everything easy equally well wrestling submissions takedowns i like his chance to find a path to victory here but he could also find himself in a war with cody stamen where if it goes to a decision and he loses you're not going to feel bad about how you spent your 12 dollars there on brian kelleher um from how many strikes he threw and he's got a chin to absorb uh what's coming back his way and just how I've I've set the fork in the road, I'll have quite a bit of Devin Clark as well, just because I see that path to victory. I have to spend money somewhere down here, and at eleven dollars, he really frees frees up a lot of options for me to get back into that tier where I'm looking at guys who can finish their fight. So you know, if you have to pick, I certainly prefer that over Felicia Spencer, who's a little bit higher. If I don't think she can secure her win bonus, you know, I don't feel comfortable spending the thirteen dollars on just volume. Well, the other thing, too, is like, in theory, Felicia Spencer gets you five rounds, but with the odds of Nunez finishing by knockout or submission early, is it really going to be five rounds? Right. And and something else to talk about is if Felicia Spencer were to win this fight outright and and shock all of us and, you know, ruin all those people that took advantage of that odds boost on FanDuel Sportsbook, (laughs) it would probably be some submission where the five round volume wouldn't come into play anyway. Spencer's submission artist, she's finished six of of her eight wins by submission. She just got a knockout in her last fight. But um, that's really what she's trying to do in there. So she's not even really trying to take advantage of the five round volume anyway. Um, I, I would be 
very, very, very stunned if she were able to outbox Amanda Nunes for five rounds. And for that reason, I just can't see it happening. One other thing about Brian Kelleher that is in your favor is that if you look at Cody Stamen's odds on FanDuel Sportsbook of a win via knockout or submission, it's plus 420, which is the longest of any favorite on this entire card. Yeah. So basically what they're telling you is that fight's going to go to a decision. And what you're saying is that Kelleher can get enough volume to pay off even if he doesn't get the 20 points for a win. Is that right. Am I interpreting you correctly? I, I think those odds are reflective of the respect for Kelleher's chin. Um, you know, he's only been finished once in his MMA career, um, as well as uh, it's also respect for the 135-pound weight class. These guys are these guys are really 135-pounders. They're just not cutting weight. Um, so the, the fight's taking place at 145 pounds, but these are smaller guys that usually fight at 135 pounds. We talked last week about the direct correlation between the size of the fighters and how often the fight finishes versus going to a decision. Um, that's certainly a play there as well, where you have essentially a bantamweight fight with the highest odds to not finish on the card. All right, Austin, any final thoughts for you before we close up shop for this late? We didn't even get to talk about my favorite fight that I'm actually looking forward to watching most as, as a fan. It's, it's uh, Aljamain Sterling and Cody Sandhagen is what is essentially a title elimination fight. So it's really okay. a round robin tournament of four at bantamweight right now. Peter Jan and Jose Aldo are expected to fight for the title. These guys, the winner of this fight on Saturday, will probably get the next title shot after that takes place. We saw Henry Cejudo retire. That's kind of what set up this cool little tournament. I I really am looking so so forward to this fight, and I actually could see it turning in one of those fights that has some volume to it. Sure. Um, I, pref- I prefer the Aljamain Sterling side because you look at Sandhagen, he, he's very much a stand-up striker. Um, Sterling will have length and reach advantages as well, and he's got wrestling and submission in, in his toolkit. So I kind of lean Sterling in that fight, and what is essentially a pick right now on FanDuel Sportsbook should be an outstanding fight and a contender for fight of the night, but I've got too many areas where I feel like I've got knockouts and finishes right. on the radar that we didn't even get to discuss it so uh I, a little little uh dessert there for everyone so that we can preview a fun fight card even if you're not getting exposure in dfs you can still enjoy you can still have some fun watching right. hopefully what will be a good fight so austin i hope that the card lives up to your expectations for it i hope that you have a lot of fun with it and i want to thank you for coming on here again today absolutely jim my pleasure we, we have an, another great fun race at uh, atlanta motor speedway this weekend as well so you and i aren't doing too bad for uh, not having yeah. too many major sports around we, we've been made it able to bide our time a little bit so it's been a it'll lot of... be hard to live up to bristol i will that's say that's right that was bristol crazy was awesome. yes. yep but other but, than that we're doing great if if the issue with nascar is that it's hard to live up to a great race that just happened we're doing all right. That That's is right. for sure. Make sure you follow Austin on Twitter at aswain 3 and check out his coverage of UFC and NASCAR DFS at numberfire.com coming up later this week. I am at Jim Sonnes, J-I-M-S-A-N-N-E-S. Uh, you can also follow the FanDuel Podcast Network at FanDuel Podcast. Another podcast coming later this week to preview that race at Atlanta, most likely on Thursday, I believe at 10 a.m. Uh, we'll be recording that, so it'll be up on YouTube, the FanDuel YouTube page, where you can also find video coverage of this uh, and video coverage of the NASCAR podcast as well. So make sure you subscribe to the FanDuel YouTube page to get all these videos as they go up. Speaking of the videos, big thank you to Calvin Theobald, our video producer, for running the video side of things here today and putting those up on the FanDuel, uh, the FanDuel YouTube page and the FanDuel Twitter account. Thank you, Cal, as always. And thank you to everyone for tuning in. Hopefully you can have fun with this card on Saturday enjoy some sporting events, just sit back and relax, and hopefully uh, win some money while you're at it. This has been the Heat Check Fantasy Podcast, powered by Number Fire.